Hello, I'm Ed Ludwig for the Doylestown Historical Society, and I'm at the runoff by studio on Mechanicsville Road, a few miles from Doylestown. And for the historical record, it's the end of September 2001. Earlier this month, on the morning of September 11th, our country and the world experienced a never-to-be-forgotten attack on our way of life. And those unspeakable events have dwarfed the significance of just about everything else. But they also emphasize how important it is for us to preserve <clears throat> for the future what is good and worthwhile about our past. And each of us in our own way, large or small, can contribute to that undertaking. The mission of our society is historic preservation, to preserve Doylestown, its persons, places, and events, so that they may be long remembered. And it is in that spirit that we film and present video histories of interesting and productive people whose lives and recollections have spanned long periods of time in our community. The video history that we're about to see is entitled, Ranulf Bai, the noted artist at age 85. He has portrayed and memorialized our beautiful countryside. Ranulf Bai's watercolor achievement covers five decades and its volume exceeds an incredible 4,000 paintings and it is continuing at the rate of more than 70 a year. His work includes a great number of Bucks County scenes and through this visual record he has brought much admiration and renown to our area a magnificent legacy. Incidentally, he traces his family roots in Holocong, not far from here, to 1699. Mr. Bai was interviewed by Sonny Howard, a resident of Doylestown whose career is in the arts and who is interested in historic uh, preservation. Our many thanks to Ranulf Bai, his wife Glenna, and uh, to Sonny Howard. And uh, we also thank Television for its able pro bono assistance in producing this film, as well as a number of our previous films. Okay, good afternoon, Mr. Bai. I'd like to thank you and your wife for allowing the Doylestown Historical Society to conduct this video history in your home studio. Perhaps we can begin by learning something about you and your family. Can you tell us where you were born, how many brothers and sisters you have, and where you grew up? Yes, Sonny. I was born in Princeton, New Jersey in 1916, and I was only there a year or so, and my family moved to Swarthmore outside of Philadelphia. And how many brothers and sisters were in your family? I have two brothers and one sister. And can you tell us briefly about your own family? Yes, I, uh, I have four children of my own from a former marriage, and they're all grown up. And uh, from that uh, establishment, I have six grandchildren. My wife, my present wife, Glenna, uh, is an accomplished artist, and uh, we live here in Mechanicsville. Now, your family roots 
in Bucks County go back to a land grant conveyed by William Penn in 1699. Isn't that correct? That's what they say. My father was a, a genealogist and he traced the family back to that period. And when did you settle here permanently? I came up here intermittently during the late 20s. I was still living in Swarthmore, but uh, I came up here permanently around uh, 1930 or so. I'd like to read a statement about your father, Arthur Edwin By, and his own distinguished art career, and then ask you some questions about what influences you think he may have had on your early development as an artist. Your father earned a doctorate in the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University in 1918, and after teaching briefly at the college level, he went to Italy to study the old masters. Upon his return, he became curator of paintings at the Pennsylvania Museum of Art, the forerunner to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And after many years in that position, he opened a gallery in Philadelphia and became an art dealer. During the Depression, he had to close the gallery, and he moved his family back to the Bai homestead in Hollacong, Bucks County, where he began a career as a busy and successful paintings restorer. In fact, one of his primary clients was the Art Museum at Princeton, an, institu an institution with which he was associated for 37 years. Do you think your father's art career had an early influence on you? I had the environment, the correct environment, to become what I like to do. And what about your mother? Was she interested in art as well? She came from a, a distinguished uh, a Dutch family, more in the business world. Her, her brothers and uh, descendants were in the shipping business, but she liked art only as a avocation. She didn't actually contribute much to my art background. Uh, did you take art classes in high school? I took all they let me take. As a matter of fact, I like shop work as much as art, you know, making lamps, uh, benches, stools, that kind of thing. I love to work with my hands. And I took all the art which the curriculum allowed me to do. And uh, I went to two different high schools. First, at West Town School, which is a friend's boarding school uh, out near Westchester. And then I went to Swarthmore High for a couple of years. But I must admit that I didn't graduate uh, from either one of those. I was so uh, anxious to get to my own love of art that I dropped high school and entered the Philadelphia College of Art around 1934. Um, and at that time, were art schools following a traditional uh, form of curriculum? I had a very, a very good academic uh, background in, in drawing. We had at the School of Industrial Art uh, some very well-trained academic painters and artists, and they were very strict about drawing and the fundamentals of of the drawing, and nothing came up about contemporary art at all when I went to art school. It was just basic, the basic uh, instruction, and it included a curriculum of not only of uh, drawing but watercolor, oil, graphics, that kind of thing. And uh, did you attempt at all to work in any of the new modes of expression, such as non-representational or abstract art? No, I didn't, Sally. I, I followed a pretty traditional curriculum of drawing and painting. Uh, the School of Industrial Art was a four-year course. And you received a diploma at the end of the period. And uh, two years later, I continued my training in New York at the Art Students League. How was this training different from what you'd received in Philadelphia? You mean at the Art Students League? Yes. No, you simply 
selected an artist that you respected and liked to teach on it. It wasn't any curriculum. There was no program. You simply uh, enrolled in a particular painter that you liked, and you stuck with it month after month. And you paid your the fee as you went along, month by month. But there was no credits to work for. Well, looking back, um, who were the most significant influences on you at this point in your career? Were there teachers or famous artists in history or, or any of your contemporaries that, uh, that inspired you? During my art career, I studied under two gentlemen, which I admired, uh, Frank Dumond in New York and F William C. Palmer. And uh, when you're in art school, you are mixed with a, quite a varied group of individuals. And just by conversation, you pick up ideas. Uh, you pick up ideas from your environment, and then you go home, think about it, and say, gee, yeah, I like to think I like to study with this person. That's what happened to me. I had an interesting experience that when I was about uh, 21 years old, uh, my mother, without any warning, just said, uh, Randolph, here's $500. What do you want to do with it? At that time, I said, gee whiz, I could buy a car. I could go on a trip. I could do this. I could, I could blow it. I said, no, I think I'll go to New York and study uh, art in one of these schools that I have heard about. And that's what happened. I made that $500 last four months. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, after you had completed some of this formal training, um, then what did you do? I came back to Holly Kong, uh, the house which I grew up in. We, we call it the farm because it, you always used to be a, a farm. So I went back to Holly Kong where my father had already established himself as a restorer, and he employed me as his assistant for quite a number of years and uh, in the restoration of paintings. And he taught me all I knew uh, about restoration, how to clean and reline paintings, fix up the damaged frames and that kind of thing. And my father, in turn, had to learn his knowledge by going to England for a year in London, where he studied under a prominent conservator in England. So uh, that's what happened to me. I, I went back to uh, our Holly Kong place, and uh, in the meantime, I got, got married, began to raise a family, and I had my own residence uh, here in Buckingham. And can you tell us something about uh, the pastel portrait that we have of you? Well, it does so happen that during my uh, development as an artist, I learned to draw pretty well with the life class, portrait work, and not only in in oil, but it also went pastel. I didn't do much watercolor during that early period. I worked very much in oil because we had models to work from, and uh, the accepted uh, medium was uh, oil on canvas. But I, I seemed to have a knack for drawing uh, things in pastel, and uh, while I was in the Army, I actually uh, had the uh, fortunate opportunity to to draw the servicemen who were at the base with me, and I could uh, do a sketch in an hour or two with a very good likeness to the uh, happy result of the, uh, of the of the artist that was, I mean, of the patient who was posing for me. And then I did one for myself. He said, he just said, Pump yourself down in a mirror and draw yourself. After uh, you were discharged from the Army, then what did you do? 
In the meantime, I was transferred from Idaho to Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And uh, Cape Cod was a beautiful place to be stationed. If you had to be stationed somewhere, you couldn't think of a more beautiful spot. Cape Cod near Falmouth. It, it's recently become, lately become a quite a, an art resort of its own. So I, uh, my wife and I, we stayed on uh, in Falmouth for two years following my discharge. And I developed this a liking for watercolor, painting the, the coast of Maine, I uh, mean the coast of Massachusetts, and had two little children to bring up. But uh, the winters were bleak, and there was very little opportunity to, to have an income. So I went back to Holocon, to the farm where my father was, and I proceeded to uh, work for him. And um, in addition to restoring paintings, how did you uh, start to work on your own as an artist? Uh, well, I had uh, a lot of freedom in that respect. I mean, I could work in the mornings for my dad if he had something for me to do. In the afternoons, I might be free to do my own work. and. Uh, Sometimes we'd have to go on short trips to do a job out of town. It so happened that one big job we had was at Gerard College, Philadelphia. And I had a friend of mine who helped me restore a large mural in Gerard College. It was a several weeks' work, working up on a scaffold. And uh, one time at lunch break, I decided that I'm going to look for a job. So I. I went over to uh, Moore College of Art, which was only a few blocks away from Gerard College, and I asked the dean. I had a portfolio of my work with me, showed it to him. He was quite uh, uh, impressed by it, and he said, you can start work in the fall. You're hired. <laughs> and that was Moore College of Art. I stayed there for 30 years. And uh, you taught watercolor there? I taught not right away, I taught drawing mostly. Watercolor was subsequently taught later on, but no, I just had a job teaching students how to draw in charcoal and pastel on paper from a model. And uh, I also became acquainted with some commercial establishments in New York publishers of Christmas cards and magazines, so I, I also had that to do on the side. When did you start to do house portraits? Because I know that you're fairly well known for those kinds of commissions. It's hard for me to pin an exact date on that, but uh, during my career as a watercolor painter, I, I became cognizant of the interest of buildings and uh, not just landscapes, which have a limited uh, amount of interest to me, but I liked uh, villages and uh, towns where they had a, 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 a varied uh, collection of, of, of architecture built over couple of centuries, you know, in Philadelphia especially has a, a tradition of a, a fine architecture from colonial times up to the Victorian period. And I liked these buildings. I, I just visually, I liked to see them, and so I began to paint them. And uh, when you're dealing with a building, that's a, a complex uh, effort you have to make. It's not, it's not easy to sit down and get the perspective right, the proportions, get the light the way you want it. It would entail uh, several return trips to the subject to do a, a good street scene or, or a house painting. And uh, I began to exhibit my work and, and exhibitions, and people would 
eventually come up to you and say, Mr. Bai, I, I live so and so, would you like to come look at my place and maybe you find something to paint? So it was uh, really not uh, a purposeful uh, thing on my part. It just happened uh, uh, by, by itself. Well, Mr. Bai, you've already told us that you did learn watercolor when you were in art school. Um, how did it come to be your preferred method? I think, uh, to answer that question honestly, uh, I'm an outdoor person, and I, uh, and I found out that in watercolor, you could take your paint box with you in two, uh, two hands in your easel and plump down uh, wherever you saw a subject that appealed to you. In oil, it's more cumbersome. You have heavy paint box and easel, brushes, and uh, that becomes uh, burdensome. Watercolor is much simpler. And uh, I always stood up at painting. I'm not a sit down. I don't sit down. I stand up at an easel and paint. You have more freedom. So uh, I developed watercolor because it was simple, much easier to to uh, move around, and the results were more quickly achieved. You could do a landscape watercolor in a couple of hours and come home with something that worthwhile. In oil, I wasn't a facile oil painter like some people were. I, I belabored the medium, but in watercolor I learned to paint rather freshly and freely. So I liked it for that reason. But on the other hand, watercolor can be very meticulous and tedious if you want it to be. You can sit down in front of a, a building or a barn and draw it in, in amazing detail, which some artists still do today. But I'm sort of in between. I'm not too uh, exact in my rendering, and I'm not too broad. I'm sort of in, be in between. It suits me, suits my temperament. But I, I must say that I like oil too. I've been painting in oil ever since I took up painting. And I would save oil for more contemplative work, work which would be more studio ex executed, where you bring in sketches from your trips outside and work them up into a, a canvas which would be larger than something you take out in the field. You're also known as an, a landscape artist, and there's been a rich tradition of landscape painting in Bucks County. Some well-known artists that come to mind are Daniel Garber, Edward Redfield, William Lathrop, Fern Coppage, and of course there are many others. Um, did you know any of these artists? And have you been influenced by any of them? Yes, Sonny, I knew all the artists that you mentioned, but I never became very closely attached to them, and they didn't uh, influence me in my development. Uh, the ones you mentioned were another generation uh, than my own. Uh, Garber and Redfield and uh, Lathrop were already uh, old enough to be my father. But I associated myself more with a young, with the next group that came along, which was Jack Follinsby and Harry Lee Ross and uh, George Sauter. They were also uh, very fine painters, and I got to know them much better. But I didn't go there to, to, let, to uh, enter any. They didn't have classes. I simply became acquainted with them. And, I, and you learn, I think you learn art from observation and practice. And uh, in art school you may get basic training in how to handle your materials, but after that you're on your own. You learn to paint on your own. And you, and you attend exhibitions and meet prominent artists and you, you simply uh, grasp what they do 
visually and go home and do it yourself, your own way. Uh, a great percentage of your work also documents vernacular architecture. Um, can you tell us what it is about buildings that makes them such an interesting subject for you? Well, I think uh, America, as well as other parts of Europe, uh, went through a period in the 19th century, or yeah, the 19th century, where they developed a very ornate, rich uh, architectural style. We call it uh, Second Empire, or you can call it Victorian or gingerbread, and they embellished their buildings with uh, brackets and carving and balustrades, which were simply ornamental uh, attributes to the building. They weren't, they didn't have much functional design. And visually, it's exciting to, for me to see it and to draw it. So I, I like Victorian architecture with its uh, rich embellishment. And uh, if you look today, it's what's being, the houses today are just box-like. They're just geometric shapes, which have no uh, excitement to me. But, but if, it, uh, if it has some decoration in the cornices, that, that excites me. Uh, Mr. Bike, would you tell us about your travels and where you've painted outside of Bucks County? Yes, Annie. I've been traveling all my life because both my father and mother uh, found reasons to travel. My mother was a Hollander, so she uh, would want to go to Holland occasionally to see her family. My father went to England, Holland, and Italy uh, to acquire and observe paintings for his art uh, knowledge. And we, as kids, we'd accompany them just like on a vacation. So, but when we were grown up and on our own, we continued that, uh, that program. I've been to Ireland myself seven different times. Ireland's a beautiful rural place to go, just very exciting. Uh, I've taken slides in all these trips. I, have, I must have thousands of slides put in different categories. Uh, you have to be careful that you don't get them all mixed up. You, I try to label each group of slides to where it was and what year. Then I go through these slides and I can sometimes paint from them. It's the next best thing than painting on location. Uh, sometimes you're not in a spot long enough to paint a finished painting, so you, you might do some sketches and in conjunction with taking pictures, you can come home and do a, a painting. Do you have any interest in any of the other traditional genres such as still life or Oh yes, you're right. I, painting. I have went through a period of doing a rather carefully rendered still lives. I don't do so many anymore, but I like to do still lives, set something up with interesting uh, selection of flowers, vases, jugs, fruit, tablecloths. Uh, this has been uh, inspiration for centuries to different artists. Some artists have done nothing but still lives their whole career, but I've done it and sort of dropped it lightly. Mr. Bai, uh, I know that you've written, illustrated, and published several books, and could you tell us something about them, beginning with your first book, A Vanishing Depot? I think it simply developed because I, I was enamored of, of a uh, locomotive period, steam engines, and of course that immediately suggests uh, railroad stations. And looking at buildings, uh, I found that stations were had a particular uh, design of their own, different from a house or a church or a mill or a barn. It had its own uh, 
particular quality. And that got to me. I thought, gee, this is, these repair rotations are all a little bit different and they're kind of quaint and paintable. So I, I started to paint them, not with an idea of having a book. That came later, but I simply liked the, visually to, to see them. And I noticed that they, each station was a little bit different from another. And later on, that developed to other books on, on architecture. Yes, I know you, you wrote one with your sister, the uh, noted Bucks County architectural historian, Margaret Byritchie. Yeah, that was more of a Victorian, a Victorian period. And that took quite a bit of time because uh, Victorian architecture in itself is complex and uh, compared to railroad stations. And I had to do a good many of these from from the photographs I'd taken. To sit down in front of a Victorian building would be a very time-consuming, tedious uh, period of painting. But uh, I, did, I did quite a few uh, uh, during the period of between 1970, 1980, trips to Maine through New England, uh, Pennsylvania, even down south through uh, Virginia and uh, South Carolina. I found some wonderful Victorian homes and buildings and I wanted to put them down on paper. Even buildings like I did the, in Boston, the, the first Presbyterian church in Boston, which is a very ornate building. I did that at uh, one time. I did the uh, in New York City, the original uh, courthouse on uh, upper, upper Manhattan, because it was a very rich, richly uh, designed building. And in the Doylestown area, I think you've also recorded some I've of I've done a few in Doylestown. I've done the Lenavy building, the old Intelligencer building, which is still extant. Uh, I've done quite a few street scenes, uh, State Street, Court Street, Pine Street, both Mercer buildings, the, the Mercer Museum and the Font Hill and, and the Moravian Tile Works. I've done all three of those structures. They're very unique. How hard has it been for you to find a publisher and to secure financing for this kind of a venture? You know, the, the business of publishing books is expensive, and I didn't have the wherewithal to publish my uh, own books with my limited uh, resources. I happened to be fortunate in uh, knowing a client of mine who uh, was sympathized with my uh, projects, and he came forward and offered to assist me uh, to publish these two or three of my books. So I was lucky in that respect. I had some financial backing. Uh, and I also knew some individuals who were in the printing business without having to go to a big uh, urban uh, printing house in Philadelphia, New York. I found some printers locally who did very uh, good work. Uh, the last book you published was Randolph Bayes' collection of old firehouses. Um, can That's you tell right. us something about that? In the course of my painting career, uh, going from town to town, I would observe uh, a firehouse or a courthouse or a railroad station, and it would stick in your mind. You wouldn't do much about it right away, but uh, it finally came to a point where I thought, well, firehouses, you know, they're, they're kind of even different than a railroad station. And so I'm going to chuck these out some more and paint a few of them. And I didn't do them all at once. Uh, some of my firehouses I had observed 15, 20 years ago, and I just filed them away in my mind. But then I, when I got into it, I decided to return to these firehouses, which I had seen, 
and make paintings of them. And once it gets into your blood, you can't stop. You, I make special trips, go 100 miles to find a firehouse. I still like to look for stations. I go into town and I, I uh, frustrate my family by trying to find where the firehouse is. Well, you seem to have a genuine interest in the relationship between man and his environment. How would you compare Bucks County, um, particularly the areas around Doylestown, with other places in America and abroad? And how, would you, how do you feel about the recent changes you've seen here in the continuing pressures of development? Yeah, that's a fair question. It's a, it's a question which uh, evokes a kind of discontent in my, in my mind. Uh, some of, most of my, a lot of my subject matter is no longer uh, in a, uh, to be seen uh, because of development. Uh, many of the uh, barns and farms that I used to paint are now centers of uh, housing units. And uh, this has disturbed me. It's very frustrating to go to some of these locations that I used to paint and find it wiped out. So uh, I find myself going further afield. I go up into uh, Northampton, Lehigh County, Upper Bucks, uh, and I find the uh, the rural uh, situation not too different, not too changed, which uh, which I like to see. I another you know another thing, if you painted one area for fifty or sixty years like I do, you begin to become immune to to what's there. You've done it already several times. Uh, you want to see something else, something different. So we, my wife and I, we take trips to get a change, get away from what's here every day. And uh, I will go through my slides and see, well, I painted this, I painted that. I don't want to do it again. Sometimes I do the same thing t two or three times and that, that's it. You know, you have to uh, uh, revitalize yourself by uh, going away. Many artists find, uh, find out outlets for their work by associating themselves with a particular gallery. Did you do that? Yes, I did. I think the uh, first experience I had with a gallery was Newman's in Philadelphia. They're still uh, in existence and it's a very well-known and prominent art gallery. And I walked into the gallery one day when I was in town with a portfolio of work and I showed it to Mr. Newman and he seemed to like it and uh, he said, well, I think we can uh, arrange a schedule for you sometime in the next few months from now. And so I would, uh, for the next two or three months, I'd paint, get a selection of good work, get it framed and the gallery would give me uh, space and a reception. They would have a mailing list. People would come to your opening, and that's how it worked. But during my career, I have had many different galleries, which I don't, don't even remember what they are sometimes. Sometimes it was just a show at, without any uh, return engagement, just a one-time uh, exposure. I've shown in uh, my art, I think my first gallery was in Boston when I was living on Cape Cod after the war. I went up to a gallery called Doll and Richards in Boston. I was there for a couple of years. And then, so you get acquainted with the galleries in your own location where you happen to be. Uh, you mentioned that you participated in art shows. How did you um, begin uh, participating in the the local show at Phillips Mill. Most of the art organizations that I have belonged to are, have been established for 
a number of years, and uh, it's a hit or miss situation. You have, uh, over a course of time, uh, developed some paintings which you kind of like, and you say, well, I'm going to try to enter this show. There's no prerequisite. You, you, it's your own responsibility. And uh, so while I was living up here in Hong Kong, I heard about Phillips Mill. I simply entered the show with a work. Your work is juried by a selective jury, and you either in or out, and you, you're at the mercy of the jury. And uh, later on, uh, the committee can ask you whether you'd be, like to become uh, a member. So that's ha what happened to many of the clubs I sent to in New York, the Audubon Artists, the Allied Artists of America, the American Water Color Society, and the Selma Gundy Club. Uh, you simply go in as an unknown artist and just simply by the quality of your work, you may be uh, invited to join. And that's what happened to most of my experiences. I've been a member of the Selma Gundy Club in New York for 50 years, and they gave me a very special award just a couple of years ago because I was a, a member for 50 years, and now I'm, my dues are exempt. I'm a free, a free agent, you know. I, I, but it so happens at my age now, getting to New York and back is a, getting to be more and more of a problem, and uh, I don't enter these shows so much as I used to. But the, the most distinguished art show that I belong to, art group, is the American Watercolor Society in New York, and they have a very high established uh, rating for entries. And I don't always get in that show. It's tough. But I have won pro a number of prizes from AWS over the years. I've won five awards over the years. And uh, in fact, I've won awards from all these organizations. Sometimes it's a medal. But they have, they have dues. You pay dues, which are uh, nominal, and uh, and it's just a, it's an honor to be a member because you uh, are in touch with your colleagues, you get to know your your fellow artists, and it's, it becomes quite a social uh, experience. I understand that you are the only living artist in Bucks County to be elected to full membership in the National Academy of Design. Uh, these awards are elected to committees, and uh, it so happened that during the years I was showing in New York, I had a painting at the Allied Artists, I believe it was, and uh, one of the academicians happened to see it, his name was Mario Cooper, a very prominent artist in New York. And I think he liked my painting in this show. And if you're an academician, you can propose uh, artists to the committee, the selection committee. So that's what he did. He just put up our by uh, to the academy committee. And they have all these names and they think about it. But the first step is being an associate. So this, Mary Cooper put me up for associate. And I was an associate for about 10 years. And only in recent years did the, the board of directors of the academy decide to eliminate associates completely, make every associate a straight academician. So that's what I am. It just happened by a progressive step-by-step uh, -step, uh, experience. Um, can you tell us if there are any awards that are especially meaningful to you? Well, I think uh, to be uh, candid with you, uh, AWS is the most, about the most prestigious 
watercolor organization in our country. Uh, That's the American Watercolor yeah. Society. And I have won five awards in that uh, organization over a period of 15, 20 years. Uh, and uh, I, re I respect those awards perhaps more than any other, although I've won awards in ha half a dozen others. Uh, AWS uh, does have a situation where after you have won five awards, you're eligible to receive a Dolphin Fellowship. You can't earn it. It's given to you after you have done the work already. You see, you, uh, it's not a prize, it's simply a recognition of your achievement. So I'm a Dolphin member of AWS. Uh, I've been a member of the Selma Gundy Club for 50 years, and uh, I've received, I suppose, 25 or 30 awards in, during that time. They're simply certificates of uh, prize. Sometimes there'd be money attached to it, sometimes not. But uh, at one particular example at the Selma Gundy Club, I did win a, a, an important award given by one of the prominent mem members the Louis Seely Award, and for a still life painting. And I know this last spring you were awarded the Henry Chapman Mercer Award um, for your outstanding contribution to the cultural heritage of Bucks County. That must have been a thrill for you. Yeah, that's a beautiful certificate I have hanging here. It's a beautiful example of the uh, calligraphy and uh, it was presented this summer on a beautiful location outside the Mercer building in Doralstown. And uh, I didn't know I was going to get it. That was a surprise. I was very pleased, very happy to receive it. Um, I also know that your work is represented in the permanent collections of several institutions, um, such as the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, the William Penn Memorial Museum in Harrisburg, our state capital, the Reading Public Museum, uh, Moore College of Art and Temple University. Did I miss any? Yeah, sometimes when you send a painting to a show, and if the show happened to be in such and such a city, they might have a committee to select works or prizes from that annual exhibition. That, that's happened to me you know, a number of times. And sometimes the institution would have, uh, would acquire a painting for their own collection if the committee uh, advised it. That happened to me a number of times. Uh, I did have a show. I knew a, a curator of the Department of uh, History and Technology, Smithsonian Institution, way back in the 70s. And he invited me to have a show of my railroad stations uh, at, the, at the headquarters of the Smithsonian History and Technology. And they had a committee, just, they bought about five or six of them from my show. So it immediately went into the permanent collection of the Smithsonian. I had nothing to do with it except show them. And they had the committee like them enough to, to acquire them. That also happened. Uh, to a similar show in Harrisburg, where I showed some of my uh, stations there also. The Woodmere Art Museum in Chestnut Hill, Philadelphia is putting together a retrospective of your work. Uh, I think it's going to be shown early next year. Can you tell us something about that? Yes, that's, a, that's become quite a responsibility to have a retrospective of your career, which goes uh, covers a period of uh, 50 or 55 years. And most of these paintings I've done, I don't know where they are. Uh, they've been sold out of uh, galleries. I, I might know they're sold and how much I got from them, but I, I don't know who owns them. Sometimes people go into a, a gallery and buy it and walk home. I don't know who it is. So some of my best work is in private collections and I don't know where they are. So. Only occasionally do I happen to know where a good painting is. 
and this show you're talking about should represent my my quality work. And it uh, flabbergasted me when I was requested that uh, one of my patrons I mentioned earlier about publishing, he was instrumental in talking to the director, Michael Schatz of Woodmere Army, and convincing him that I should ha have a show there someday. So the three of us got together and set a date for my retrospective, and I'm working on it now. But I became so uh, almost petrified by this prospect, as where am I going to get these pictures? So I, my wife and I, we have been saving work uh, by ourselves over the years. So, so I went around the house and took an inventory of the paintings which we seem to have. And I found I had about 75 paintings stashed away in different parts of my house, and they're good paintings, so I'm going to stick them down a wood mirror. It saves me a lot of work. But then there's other p collectors that I know who have my paintings, and I've contacted them by telephone and letter, and they have graciously uh, accepted my uh, uh, request to borrow their work for a couple of months because the show will be on at least two months down there. Mr. Bai, uh, do you have any opinion on the function of art? Well, I think uh, art should communicate uh, something between the, the observer and the creator. Uh, I don't give it much thought. I like, you do what you like to do. I like to paint and uh, I don't, it's not, it's farthest from my mind to think about uh, whether this painting is going to be uh, well received or not. That's immaterial. The important thing is yourself. You, you paint what you like, what inspires you, and if it happens to communicate with somebody else, uh, that's all to the good. But I don't purposely paint a picture uh, for a show for any special person, I, you, you please yourself first. If you do a commission for somebody, that's different. Then you have to satisfy the client. It's a business uh, transaction. But when you just paint for yourself, you're only painting what you like. And uh, I, over the years I have met artists who are extremely uh, talented and gifted and wonderful to behold. Sometimes it rubs off onto you a little bit. That's happened to me over the years. Like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, sometimes it rubs off onto you and you might practice it, but it doesn't last long. You, you seem to uh, revert back to your old way of doing things. I don't like to look at art books anymore. They bore me to death. I don't. No, want to know how to do this, how to do that. I do my, I've do my. i been doing my own thing for 30, 40 years. I don't need anybody to tell me how to do anything. And, uh, and I think uh, you can see it in my work. I mean, I, the way I paint a tree or a building, I do it my way. I don't do it because so-and-so has his picture in a book. Well, I know that you've been keeping a log of your work since 1950. Three. And to date, you've completed over 4,000 paintings. That's just amazing. How many days a week do you work? Well, that figure you mentioned, 4,000, is arbitrary. Because uh, some of them are very time-consuming works. Others may be uh, sketches of done in an hour or two. But I count them anyway. I worked. I still work uh, daily in my studio. I don't go out in the field as much as I used to. Uh, in the summertime, like we're going through now, I'm not too inspired to paint uh, outdoor subjects because uh, I don't. It's, it's it's too lush, too green, too hot. Um, I like winter, fall, winter, and spring when you see the bones of a landscape better. Uh, bare trees or 
have more character in winter than in summer. So, uh, but I still paint, and I, I'm my own boss. I paint uh, usually right after breakfast and to lunch. Then I take my take a break or take a nap. And I live in a place which is constantly in need of upkeep. So I like to work outdoors a lot in the afternoons. I like to do yard work. And then the next morning I proceed with painting. Well, Mr. By, I want to thank you for speaking with us today. Good luck. Well, it was nice to you to come and share me, share with me my thoughts about art, my painting. Thank you.